Fantastic. Awesome. All right. And uh, hello and welcome, and thank you for joining us for session three of the Rural Research Collaborative Learning Network, so the R Clan Research Education and Training Calendar for 2024. This is our second year at running the calendar, and it's proving quite incredibly, uh, you know, successful so far. And we're very thrilled to be able to continue providing this. Uh, resource. So I'm Dr. Alex Stevens. I'm the Director of Research at Northern New South Wales Local Health District, and I belong to one of the member organisations of the RR Clan. Today, I'm very thrilled to be joined by one of the leading experts on knowledge translation, so Sh Professor Sharon Micken. And I'll formally introduce you to Sharon shortly, and Sharon will guide us through today's session on applying the knowledge to action framework. We'll also hear from Dr. Zoe Michaelif. So many of you may be familiar with Zoe. She's the leading force behind this RR Clan concept and also the research operations manager here in Northern New South Wales LHD. So Zoe, in addition to these roles, is also a very capable researcher in her own right and will present on a project she led in the knowledge translation space to provide a practical example of some of the concepts content uh, Sharon will cover in her presentation. So to officially get us started, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands and waters where we work and live. We acknowledge the traditional custodians living culture, their connection to country and their contribution to the life of this region. We pay our respects to the ancestors and elders of the region and to all Aboriginal people past, present and future and any Aboriginal people that may be joining us today. So welcome. Very Happy to say that we are generously supported by the University Centre for Rural Health and Rural Rivers, and they're providing some support with our uh, delivery and also the operations. So big thank you to the UCRH for doing that. Just a little bit about the collaboration so far. We've got a sizable footprint and coverage in both uh, New South Wales and Queensland. So we're covering 10 uh LHDs in New South Wales and also the Health Education and Training Institute and we've got an ever-growing footprint in Queensland including a couple of large collaborative which includes seven hospital and health services and also affiliated partner institutions very happy to have uh, anyone from those organizations attending today just a quick shout out to our growing YouTube a collection of seminars so we're posting all of our recordings uh, that we've done in 2023 and also 2024 on our youtube channel and uh, there's a link there to be able to access it just a little bit of housekeeping uh, so we've got probably a fairly sizable uh, attendance today so we haven't muted your microphones but we encourage everyone to remain on mute uh, if you possibly could um we will try to cater for questions but during the main presentation by uh, zoe and sharon if you could potentially ask any questions using the chat function we'll attempt to get to them and look if we have time at the end of the presentation we'll probably open it up to an attempt to answer some live questions uh so i've just covered that uh the final thing i want to know is we are recording today's session um for viewing at a later date look if you don't want to appear in the recording just maybe simply turn off your cameras now it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to professor sharon micken sharon has an international reputation for research and education focused on translating research evidence implementing organizational improvement and innovation and also building clinicians research capacity and engagement. So I've known Sharon for numerous years now, particularly in her role as head of program and professor of health innovations at Bond University. I know Sharon will shortly step down for this role, but instead of retiring after being in this space for nearly 40 years, she's gonna to continue to work, establishing her own consultancy, coaching and education company, which is absolutely fantastic to retain that skill and knowledge and have access to it. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Sharon and end the slideshow here. Hopefully you can share the slides on your end. Is that coming through? That is coming through, yes. But let's put it, at, is that coming through at the right, um, the right slide, knowledge translation, head um, front slide? That's, that's, Yep, it was there, and I think you just... It was there? Okay, now let me just slow it down. Okay, perfect. Well, thank yeah. you. 
So Thank just you want so to put much. Into, sorry, Shannon, just want to put it into um, presentation yeah, mode, you. slideshow. Let's do that. OK. Can, is that what you can see now? Uh, no, now I can still see your working slides. OK, let's try again. Why did it? It worked yesterday. One more time. All right. Okay, I'll start again because I think. OK, is that coming through or not? It hasn't come through. I reckon look, we can we can probably do without. Uh, hopefully people can can still. Well, make I'm just it wondering, out. shall I go back to you and ask you to split the slides through? Because for some reason this worked yesterday. Zoe and I tried it out and it worked brilliantly. But for some reason, it's just not happening right now. Yep, I can okay. share my slides and you can just tell me to flick through. Do them you mind? I'm sorry, yep. but no I think I will. OK, good. Hopefully that's all come through. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Sorry about this, but we'll make it work. And um, as I said, with everything with technology, you plan and you prepare, and then you have to do plan A, B, or C depending on the day. So we're only on plan B so far. So thanks, Alex and Zoe, for this opportunity to talk with you, with you all. I did have a quick look through some of the names and there's faces and people I recognise. Hello to those who recognise me, and hello to those who don't. Um, I'm, I'm really keen to share a really brief overview with you today. And um, on the next slide, I've actually got um, what I'd like to, to talk with you to understand. And so really what I'm going to start with today is really understand and explain to you what is knowledge translation, what is the process of it, and how do we use strategies to identify the problem that sources our either our quality improvement or our implementation project? So that I, I really want to make this relevant to people who are working in either quality improvement or implementation. And we're really going to get you started today. We're not going to take you through the whole way, although I will show you how we can use the, the model to do that. OK, so really, this here is the Canadian Institutes of Health Research definition of knowledge translation. I won't read it word for word. You can read faster than I can speak. But what I want to say is that this has been the enduring definition. The Canadians were have been the leading researchers in this area of knowledge translation. A lot of Americans talk about the area as implementation research, but I would argue that's an umbrella of knowledge translation. And essentially, um, what the reason this field has emerged over the last 20, maybe even 30 years, is it's bridging this gap between what we know in research and what is happening in practice. Um, because we know that not all research gets into practice and not all clinicians are even aware of the research that's being done. So this field has developed as both a, a research field, but also an area of practice. Um, and I guess the reason why a lot of us will know that the published research that sometimes we have to read doesn't always answer the questions that are really important to us as clinicians, because sometimes the research isn't well designed or the clinical environments are not relevant. And also on the flip side, not all. Um, yeah, if you could just click again, Alex, one, um, not all um, research actually informs practice. And so there's been a lot of research recently about, you know, we don't always use what we know and there might be 50 to 25 to 10 years to sort of passively trans, um, diffuse research into practice. And sometimes we're actually overusing un, um, either unhelpful um, or harmful treatments. So there's a whole there's a whole issue there that we're not going to get into today. But I just think what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand and use research judiciously to change and inform practice. So how do we do that? Um, again, the Canadians put together this knowledge to action framework. 
Now they put this together in 2005. It was first published by um, Ian Graham, and I've given you a reference there. There's a you can Google this and find as much information as you want. And I have been using it and teaching to it for the last 20 years. It's essentially the go-to framework that I use as a process for integrating research in the, the quality improvement framework. So if you look at the internal funnel of this, um, sorry, I've got to, if you could just flick through a couple. Um, here, I've just pulled out the knowledge creation funnel in the middle of this cycle. And this is really where we actually are looking for using the, the most synthesized high quality research we can. Now, those of you who are familiar with evidence-based practice will know that we're looking for ideally systematic reviews or scoping reviews of research evidence as the basis for why we want to change our practice. Because if we're not using high quality research, um, we may not be needing to do this whole process. So that's, I guess, the bottom line here is we're using a the um, the gray circle is a quality improvement cycle, and we're using that and we're feeding research into it. Initially, it feeds in, as you can see, through the I, through the bottom, which is where we start the process through identifying the problem. But essentially, the research can inform every step of the way. So if we go on to the next slide, what I want to say to you is we're going to use this um, knowledge to action framework just to explain a really simple scenario and how over a period of four or five years, we actually addressed a, a, a problem. So the problem in clinical practice, and this was at Gold Coast Health a few years ago now, one in 10 junior doctor's prescriptions contained an error. So this was an audit of current practice. And the reality was that the pharmacists were actually helping the junior doctors who didn't, when they were unsure about what to prescribe. So we saw there was a knowledge practice gap here. Um, and we looked at the research evidence for what, um, what could we or should we be doing. And the research evidence said very clearly that junior doctors learn through supervision. And it also said that interprofessional supervision can be effective. So we recognize that there's research evidence that suggests that we could have interprofessional supervision by pharmacists of junior doctors. But we needed to adapt that knowledge or that research knowledge to local practice. And we went through a process of action research where we had interviews with junior doctors, pharmacists and consultants. We had to understand what they thought were the issues and what, what they thought we could do about it. And then we had workshops where we actually were bringing the evidence to those stakeholders um, and we were promoting um, interprofessional supervision. And from those, those workshops, we were able to um, identify barriers and facilitators to knowledge use. We were looking at what things would work and what wouldn't work. And together with um, those key stakeholders, the junior doctors, pharmacists and consultants, we actually implemented a pilot of co-supervision. This is something that hadn't been formally done before. And so we were putting pharmacists together with junior doctors in a, in a formal co-supervision relationship. And we did that, um, we selected that as a pilot intervention, which we then monitored and evaluated over time. We used some self-report questionnaires and interviews and across those that, that process of evaluation, we heard from both the junior doctors and the pharmacists that positive learning in a supportive environment can actually support a change in roles and expectations. So the pharmacists could be validated for helping the junior doctors and the junior doctors could be supported to seek help from the pharmacists. And that process, as, as you see, it was reported in 2017, um, has been sustained. And there is a routine, a relationship of at least seven pharmacists co-supervising um, junior doctors um, ongoing at Gold Coast Health at the moment. So that sort of just gives you a really, you know, umbrella, um, helicopter view, whatever you like, of how this knowledge to action framework can actually guide a process of research that actually occurred over four or five years. And we're continuing to, to develop and monitor that. So let's, um, any questions or comments at this stage about making sense of that? Is there anything that people would like to clarify? 
OK, if, it, if that makes sense, then what I'm going to do is take you back through. Let's go back to the beginning and let's start um, as a group and as um, and all of you can also think about your own local practice as we're going through this, because the best place to start is here at the bottom where the, the knowledge, the research evidence um, starts to identify a problem. And here, um, I think it's really important to recognise this knowledge practice gap or what the no do gap. And so on the on the next slide, um, I think Alex, I talk about knowledge translation as being that that understanding the difference between what is happening in research and what is happening in practice. And usually this starts with um, clinicians, in fact, recognising that their practice doesn't reflect research. And often they don't know why. And it's not always logical. So this is the bit that we start with that that realization. And I, I guess I really like to start with clarifying this knowledge practice gap. So yeah, so Dave, David Edwards, who who may have missed the overall time frame for that process used in the the, the um, pharmacy example, that process took the process on the on the page took um, three years. So it's not something we do overnight, um, but it, if we're careful and consider, um, we can make changes over a period of time. So on the next slide, um, Alex, I think, oh yeah, sorry, the next one. Um, I, I really like to talk about the importance of getting started with a clear knowledge practice gap. So that it really is important to make sure that you've got the highest quality research evidence that you can find summarized. And, and often for clinicians, this is in practice guidelines. But also at the same time, it's important that you currently um, document what's happening in local practice. Because if we're going to change anything, we need a clear baseline. And here we like a baseline that of data that's automatically collected so that we don't have to um, spend time and energy collecting it, if possible. But sometimes you do. we do have to do our own audits for spe um, specifically for these projects. So it's really important to look at the research evidence to know what outcomes they say are likely to change, and then try to look for ways that you can measure those outcomes, or as close as you can, those outcomes in current practice, because this gives you your baseline. Because if we haven't got a, if we can't measure change, there's a lot of our colleagues who will say that we can't, it didn't happen. And I think we need to be really clear that we've got to have strong baseline measurements before we um, entertain this project. So um, what I, let me talk to you about a, a knowledge practice gap that I've been working in recently. I've been working in the area of malnutrition and I've been working in aged care. And so we know that malnutrition contributes to an increase in morbidity, length of hospital stay, mortality and health spending. So um, it's really important then to look at um, the, the, the particular type of um, mal what, what, you know, the clinical guideline for your practice, because malnutrition is important in, in acute care as well as it is in aged care. And so one of the things that we've been looking at from an aged care perspective you know, is malnutrition screening happening in aged care homes? Yes, for some, no for others. Do is there is there any underlying um reference um measurements around the the numbers or the proportion of residents who are able to live um eat independently? Is that assessed? Is that monitored? What sort of accessibility to fresh food is there? And what is the rate or usage of nutritional supplements? So this is um, when we're talking about malnutrition screening in aged care environments, we want to know as much about that information as possible. And what we're finding is that different aged care settings will automatically record um, residents' body mass index and or foods eaten, and, and this will be recorded automatically. In others, we have to do it in an addition. So 
I don't know whether other people are relating to this, whether they can identify a knowledge practice gap in their own area or around a problem of malnutrition. Could you frame it in terms of your practice for those of you who might be working with a, a dietetics background? Or um, in fact, it may even be something about the functional, the functional um, process of eating. Because the other thing we're looking at in aged care is can, can um, the eating experience be used to promote, to improve the record, records of loneliness, but that's a different story. So hopefully by now we've got a picture of a, of a gap between the research evidence says all uh, everyone should be screened and treatment provided according to their level of malnutrition. Um, and then we need to know what is actually happening. OK, so and, and actually this is really um, timely because people are starting to recognize in the research is how do you summarize your research evidence? And here. Um, I've, I've, I would strongly recommend um, ask a librarian to help you, ask a colleague who understands evidence-based practice, who, who knows how to search, um, because it is really important to um, have that high quality research evidence to get started. And then also um, in terms of what is currently ha happening in local practice, you know, look for ways that data is automatically collected. So as I said to you, one of the things we went into when we were going into nursing care settings, we were asking them, are you routinely collecting patients' weights? Are you routinely collecting something about whether what, what is eaten, levels of wastage? Are you routinely collecting something about the proportion of supplements being used? And so this data could be, could be useful if it was routinely collected, but if it wasn't, we would have to find ways of doing that. Okay. And so this is really, again, just emphasizing this knowledge part of the problem is the importance of also, you know, as a, as a clinician, maybe you don't want to engage directly with the research evidence. You're happy to look for clinical guidelines. That's OK. I mean, there's, a, there's an argument about some clinical guidelines may not be up to date, but if you're at least using clinical guidelines to, to inform your practice, that's really important. But if you have more time and um, energy and or ex expertise to be able to access, look for systematic reviews, and also clarify from the research what is the best practice model of care that could be provided or should be provided for that patient group. And then, yeah, I think we can, I think I've already said what's on this slide. So then I think the importance here is when we're talking about um, getting started on these quality and implementation projects, I've, I've really hounded on about identifying that knowledge practice gap. But then from that knowledge and from your practice, it's really quite important to be able to think about what specifically you want to improve. What is, you know, what are the behaviours? What sh Who should be doing what differently? And this is about building a um, an improvement goal. And that's that's you know that's adapting your knowledge to the local context, and then it's important to identify who can help you. Now, sometimes it's important to find stakeholders earlier on, but here I really want to emphasise the importance of identifying and engaging with um, stakeholders. So on the next slide, we talk about who stakeholders are, and these are anybody, either an individual or a group, who have an interest or a concern in the particular change you're likely to um, want to implement and who, who could be impacted. And they can be involved in any of these processes. And, and the importance of stakeholders, if it comes back to human behaviour, most of us don't want to be told what to do by somebody who we don't know. So it's really important if you're asking people to change their behaviour, that they're involved in the process of understanding why. And this may not necessarily be every single person, but it's about groups of stakeholders. And so again, as we start to engage with our stakeholders, and identify who they are, we need to make sure that they're in agreement with us that there is a knowledge practice gap. If they don't see the problem, it could be tricky moving forward. We also wanna understand different stakeholders comparative power and interest for the change that we want to make. So power is the ability to support 
or the ability to block change. And interest is that personal motivation for that change. And if we understand those, we can actually be really be very um, clear and careful to uh, look at those um, stakeholders who have high power and high interest and really start to understand their individual barriers and facilitators for specific changes or improvements. Because um, again, most of us don't want to be told what to do unless we understand why we're making a change. And so it's really important that stakeholders understand the research evidence, understand what you want to do, and um, be, and be, you know, that we have a conversation to align them with this program of change. Because then if they're on side with us, we can actually ask them for support, for resources. Often they can tell us what data is being automatically collected. And down the track, they're really helpful as stakeholders to co-design some of our implementation strategies and also to help us monitor and evaluate outcomes. So I think the bit that I want, I've want i learned the most about over the last um, 20 years of working and researching in this space is engaging with stakeholders early and often is the key to success of any improvement or implementation project. And so then, if we look at this this um, this wheel or the the knowledge to action framework, I think the role of stakeholders is to agree with the problem, recognize that it's important to that organization, agree on the improvement goal. And then, as we're starting to understand their barriers and facilitators to the to to the change or to the use of the research knowledge, we're in a position to start co-designing implementation strategies. And so what I, I'm not going to go into that in a lot more detail for today because I really wanted to just get us um, started and then I want to give Zoe a chance to take, take you through an example that she's worked on with us. But at this point, it becomes really important from our stakeholders point of view to understand the barriers and facilitators to individual behavior change, as well as organizational readiness for change. And together, those two concepts enable um, the team of the, your important, you know, your a key advisory group of stakeholders to co-design your implementation strategies, which you then monitor and evaluate as you go through. So that's where I want to um, sort of finish my sort of instructional work today, because I think it's really important to kind of get us thinking about um, starting with something of substance, because there is a bit of effort that goes into analysing our stakeholders and looking at barriers and facilitators and identifying implementation strategies. So this is why I've created this worksheet for, for each of you individually to, to take away and, and work use with your own um, workplace knowledge practice gaps. And I'm also um, going to suggest that um, as I hand over to Zoe to talk you through a project that she was involved with, that you might want to, as you're listening to Zoe, you might want to sort of make notes about what what um, what you're hearing, just as a way to get you thinking um, a bit more analytically. So that's kind of where I um, was imagining that I would um, stop t um, talking a lot. I, um, I don't know whether people want to clarify anything further at this stage, or shall I um, hand over to Zoe? We certainly have opportunity for questions now. If anyone wants to put up their hand, we can take some questions. And uh, if there aren't any, that that's fine. We can open up for more discussion again after Zoe's gone through um, you know, presenting her slides. Uh, OK, Zoe, maybe we'll just hand over to you. I'll stop sharing and we'll go through your, cool. the work that Thanks, you've Alex. done. Thank you very much, Sharon. And I'll have a go at sharing my screen. Excellent. Does that come up? Looks good. Looking Thanks. Good. Yeah. Lovely. Thanks. Zoe. Thanks. Good. Thanks so much, Sharon. And um, thank you for tackling the knowledge to action cycle and how to introduce it and how to frame it. And it's been a fantastic start to just sharing with you how I went about my project and identifying the knowledge practice gap. 
So um, just for those of you who don't know me, my name is Zoe Michael F. I'm the Research Operations Manager at Northern New South Wales Local Health District. And I'll be talking to you today about a project that I undertook when I was a postdoctoral research fellow at the Institute of Evidence-Based Healthcare at Bond University. And my introduction to the Knowledge to Action framework really started a bit fortuitously um, with a corridor conversation with Sharon, just explaining my project. And Sharon's like, actually, that's a knowledge, that's an implementation project. And this whole framework was new to me, but as soon as she started talking, she hooked me in uh, as she does so well, and I was sold. And it just put so much logic and a framework around what I was approaching, what I thought was logically, and it just makes so much sense. So it really was my aha moment, and I hope you can have the same aha moment as you reflect on today's presentation. So I'm going to share with you today a project um, called the Easier Project. Um, it's evaluating the use of clinical decision aids in the emergency department. And I'm just going to share with you how I went about identifying the knowledge to practice gap. Using Easier as, as an example, um, my background is as a physiotherapist and as a physio, we're sort of deeply rooted in evidence. And so when I approach most things in life, I look for the evidence. And so if that's knowledge or information. And so that's where I'm going to start with this, you know, sharing my experience with you today. And so thinking about clinical decision aids for people who may not be familiar with clinical decision aids, these are rules that synthesize three or more findings from the patient's history, physical examination, or a simple diagnostic test to guide diagnostic and treatment decisions. And there are hundreds of clinical decision aids that are available, but actually only a select few or really a handful have undergone rigorous testing and evaluation and have really been found to be valid and reliable for use. And this handful of clinical decision aids are the ones that we should really be implementing into practice. And they're recommended for use by the Royal and New Australian and New Zealand College of Radiographers, and they're showcased in a lot of clinical practice guidelines. So they really are best practice and should be implemented into practice. Uh, and the reasons for this is that there's potential benefits for patients, including reducing waiting times and exposure to unnecessary procedures and, and radiation, so things like CTs and X-rays. For clinicians, there's evidence that they improve adherence to clinical practice guidelines. There's reductions in practice variations. And for the clinician, it reduces decisional uncertainty. And lastly, for the healthcare service or system, um, it's improving the overall value and efficiency of care and it's promoting responsive resource allocation because really those who are assessed to be at highest risk of a, a severe injury and requiring sort of further care or imaging, they're the ones who these clinical decision aids identify. And if your patients identify at lower risk, that you can safely discharge them or, or provide them with other sort of education advice or assurance. And so there's this body of evidence that's saying clinical decision aids are there. If they're valid, reliable, we should be using them. And there's also this body of evidence that's saying that clinical decision aids are underutilised in practice. And this evidence is, is internationally recognised. So there's considerable variations in clinic, clinicians' knowledge of clinical decision aids. And it might de depend on where the decision aids were like developed and, and validated. So Canadian rules are obviously more widely used and known in Canada as opposed to other parts of the world and perhaps how long those clinical decision aids have been in, in circulation for. When people have assessed uh, clinicians self-reported the use, there's lower reports of self-reported use. And when you actually look at objective evidence about levels of documentation, we know that clinical decision aids are really documented in the clinical notes, which again can potentially lead to overimaging. So when patients get transferred to the ward or discharged or wherever else, um, the, the, the team that are taking over care of that patient might then re-image or, or do further investigations because there's not that documentation. So there's that replication in care. So we're starting from quite um, a robust knowledge base. And when we're thinking about clinical decision aids, as Sharon was saying that this funnel, um, clinical decision aids would really sit down at the base of the funnel because the ones that have been validated and found to be um, reliable 
uh, are really ready for implementation into practice. And these tools themselves are already synthesising large amounts of information and they're then reported in clinical practice guidelines. So they're really at this point ready to be implemented, which takes us into the implementation cycle around the knowledge funnel. And so thinking about this amount of knowledge that we've got out there, it made me think about, okay, then what's happening in practice? And as Sharon highlighted, stakeholder engagement is so important for projects to work. Um, so I approached this project with this knowledge base in my head. I approached um, clinicians in Gold Coast Hospital and Health Service ED and just started to put my feelers out and have a chat to people thinking about, oh, is this project something that's important? Is our clinical decision rules relevant to the setting? What's people's sense? Just to get an idea of how engaged people were in this topic. Perhaps um, conveniently or, or by chance, there was a parallel project being undertaken by Dr. Letitia Hedding at the same time. And her project was looking at analysing clinicians' ordering patterns of CT head, neck and spine scans and to explore decision-making process and the reasons for ordering um, these images and investigations. And the findings of this study were that um, there were several factors, obviously, that went into clinicians' decision-making to order CT heads, necks and spines. And something that we found that was sort of a bit haphazard and perhaps not consistently reported was the use of clinical decision aids. And some people, we started to get this inkling and idea around the barriers and facilitators um, to uh, clinical decision aids. And also just that some people were really for them, some people had some reservations. And so using a small sample, uh, the findings from this small sample and, and the references they made to clinical decision aids just reflected that larger body of knowledge. And so it made me think, OK, maybe the setting wasn't so different to what, what the knowledge base suggests. But I still had lots of questions around the local context. So who was using clinical decision aids? Um, clinical decision aids have been found to be able to be used by doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, and they can use them equally as well. But they're not always within the scope of practice or there might be some hierarchical or or structures within each department that prevent people maybe working within their scope of practice. So who was using these aids in, in Gold Coast? Um, what clini clinical decision aids were used by health professionals and did these vary by profession? How and when were clinical decision aids integrated into the, the clinical contact uh, and workflow? And were, cl were clinicians documenting the use of clinical decision aids? And so these were my practice gaps. And so to address this, to really define this uh, knowledge practice gap, um, I undertook a mixed methods study to determine healthcare professionals' knowledge, use and documented adherence of clinical decision aids in the emergency department at Gold Coast Hospital and Health Service. And to answer this question, as I mentioned, so I undertook a mixed methods uh, study, which consisted of two studies. Firstly, a survey of all the staff that worked in ED at Gold Coast Hospital and Health Service. So that was Gold Coast Hospital and Ravina Hospital. Um, and then also did a, a medical record audit for the, the four um, clinical decision aids that were identified to be of highest priority for clinicians to implement. And the reason that we did two sort of different study approaches to do this is that the evidence that we, we gained from both sides gave us slightly different information about the same problem. And again, this reflected our, our broader knowledge of, of the, the knowledge base that supported the use of clinical decision aids. So um, when we developed the survey, we did so in a, a way that was a theory informed and it enabled us to identify determinants of behaviour that might be influencing the uptake and implementation of clinical decision aids into practice. And so when we did the survey, um, what we found was that healthcare professionals' knowledge and self-reported use of clinical decision aids was generally quite low. Um, and only four of the 21 clinical decision aids that we assessed were reported to be used sometimes or always by most of the respondents. And in doing so, we were able to identify four clinical decision aids that were sort of high priority to implement if we were able to integrate this sort of decision making into the electronic medical records. 
A positive finding though from the survey um, was that most respondents wanted to increase their use of valid and reliable clinical decision aids and they really supported this idea of integrating clinical decision aids into the electronic medical records to facilitate their use of evidence um, and also support their documentation. So they really found some benefits and think, yes, this is something that we want to, be, to, to get involved in. And so without really realising it, we were identifying um, the local context and clinicians' preferences for how perhaps down the track we might develop and design our implementation strategies and the, the intervention itself. And through the questions we were asked, we gained a lot of information about their preferences and their timing of delivery and how they would want um, whatever the intervention or decision support system to operate. Um, we also identified the barriers, uh, including that a lot of these tools potentially were out of scope of practice for clinicians. They weren't able to recall the tools and you know, the, the impact of professional influences in the ED. And so the long and the short of it is that do, using this type of approach, we, we not only identified the problem, determined the gap, we identified aspects of local context and not, uh, barriers and facilitators, and all this information was really valuable and will be valuable moving forward when we're thinking about uh, developing strategies or, again, a, a response to, to implement the clinical decision aids into practice. In terms of the medical record audit, as I mentioned, it's just giving us um, objective information about, as opposed to collecting subjective use of clinical decision aids, we're now looking at objective, is this documented or not? And again, we found that um, uh, several of these rules were documented in less than 50% of occasions. So there was definitely room for improvement. So undertaking this exploration, we really were able to um, clarify our knowledge to practice gap. We know that clinical decision aids are, are useful. Uh, we know that in this setting that they use about 50% of the time, but clinicians are, are quite keen to, to increase their use. We also identified barriers and facilitators that we can then design perhaps how we can integrate them into the, the medical records in a, in a way that's fits fit for purpose and, and needs meets the needs of the clinicians who will use it. So this was phase one, really clarifying and defining that knowledge practice gap. So where to from here? The next stages of this project would look around co-designing clinical decision support systems and a strategy to, to integrate clinical decision aids into the electronic medical records. And that's going to involve a whole lot more of stakeholder engagement. So qualitative interviews and focus groups to really understand what do the clinicians want and when do they want this evidence-based information coming into like their, their clinical workflows. Uh, clinical walkthroughs, so watching clinicians in practice, thinking about, well, when do they want this information? How do they want it seamlessly integrated? And then obviously once a prototype or a pilot's developed, um, system developed, we'd have to undertake a fair bit of usability testing to make sure that the, whatever we develop is fit for purpose. Down the track further, um, it'd be around evaluating the outcomes if we were to, to implement something into these clinical decision aids into the electronic medical records. And so it might be around just re-evaluating clinicians' awareness, use and documentation of clinical decision aids. Um, so this audit that we did really does form a nice baseline comparison that we could re-evaluate down the track to see if our intervention had an impact. And lastly, the last phase of the knowledge translation cycle is around sustainability. So it might be around, say, what we developed was effective. It might be around uh, developing a sustainable training plan. So as new doctors, new nurses, new physios come into the emergency department, getting them up to speed about that there's evidence embedded into the system. It might be around expanding the suite of clinical decision aids that are actually integrated into the electronic medical records. And it might be around exploring integrating these into other hospital and health services. So that's just one example of a project that I was involved in. Um, I'm very happy for any questions or happy to pass questions on to Sharon. Thank you very much, Zoe. So while people are thinking of any potential questions, a big thank you to, to Sharon and also you, Zoe, for presenting today and, and covering a topic 
I'm trying to think of what word I was going to use to describe knowledge translation. I, I was going to come up with complex, but complex may not fully capture it. I think it, it's potentially daunting, something that's probably viewed as daunting, right, to, to you know, clinicians and, and healthcare staff. And I'm hoping this presentation, this overview you provided, Sharon, also that practical example you've covered, Zoe, um, provide some clarity on, on how to practically apply what is a fantastic framework to you know, solve issues or problems or enhance the level of care that anyone may be providing. Um, so thank you very much for, for taking the time. We can open it up for questions. And if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand. I can't see any coming through. But potentially while people are thinking of questions, Zoe, we might give a plug to the next session. So we've got the amazing Dan Barry from Northern New South Wales. LHD, that, that photo there really doesn't do it justice. He's, Dan's an incredible high functioning individual and he's a senior, I guess, statistician working in our, our, our LHD and he's kindly volunteered to do a session on finding and using data for health research, providing an overview. I think uh, Zoe, we can provide the registration link that session I'll just add to yes, the I'll, chat. I'll pull that out as well Alex. I think well I may have beaten you to it it looks kind of weird as a formatting and while we still have you look if you want to provide any feedback we've been running this consistent evaluation survey every time we've, we've done it um if you could spare you know a few minutes to provide some feedback on the session we're always looking to improve our processes and, and what we're doing we can't see any questions. Sharon, do you have any final I, well, reflections? Well, I guess I just comments? I just want to make a bit of a comment, um, a comment and respond to people some the ideas that we've we've really tried to sim I really tried to simplify how to get started with knowledge translation today. And and I want to recognize that there is a lot more theory and and um analysis behind understanding knowledge um the the barriers and facilitators to change and understanding and analyzing organizational readiness for change. So there's a whole lot of areas there that we, we you know, that um, over 20 years of research, um, we've got a whole lot of theories that could help us. And I don't want to flood people with those ideas, but I do want to say that if you are genuinely starting to, to go that way, then seek out somebody who has some experience of implementation and, and ask for some peer mentoring support because um, there is a really big opportunity to learn with and from each other. It is common sense, but we're, we're using both behavioral and organizational theories to inform how we support change. And that is what's unique about this whole area because in the past, I feel like, you know, as a, as a healthcare leader of 30 years or more in healthcare, you know, a lot of us just get up and do stuff. And, you know, if it works, it works and we're lucky. And if it doesn't, oh, well, don't worry. Try again another day. And there's no analysis or no understanding of why something worked or something didn't work. And I feel like I, I, I'm quite passionate that we've, we're have we not using our learnings from those experiences. And all we're doing is we're actually building resistance to change amongst the people that we're working with. So those of you who are seriously uh, serious about leading change, I really want you to to take you know to to get that get this knowledge practice gap framed, and then go find an implementation scientist or a facilitator or a research broker or you know there's a lot of us that are working in this space, and and just ask for some mentoring as you're going through it, because I think I, I also want to say to you, Alex, that yes, we are working in complex systems, and one of the you know I've been teaching complexity this last semester. And one of the things um, about complexity is that we get expected and unexpected outcomes for what we try to do. <laughs> and so a lot of the time I'm kind of like, oh, just, just don't worry about the unexpected. But I think we, it is important to recognize that in complex systems, things don't always go as planned. And so it is important that we have a clarity of why we're doing what we're doing so that when things do go a little bit awry, we can, we can bring it back. And I think that's what I, I just wanted to put the the contextual. You know, I don't want to I don't want to overcomplicate it now at the last minute. But I want to say that you know this focus has been to get you started, 
Um, and then, yeah. That's so I awesome. guess Ka Caitlin's got said that, yeah, how far do they go to improve it? I mean, I think I think the how far you go is how how ex how much your stakeholders and yourselves are prepared to try things out, and and develop good good ideas. So it is really um, working with your stakeholders. You've got to find sponsors who want to work with you. If you do this on your own, people will be excited for you, but won't support you when you turn your back. So it is about if you really want to sustain change, you get the key key stakeholders going with you. Now, Greg Ortz asked about finding key people to roll out change in organisations. There, I think you have to ask because there's a lot of people, what we, would, what we would call local opinion leaders, people who have some knowledge about implementation, who would be who would love to share it if they're asked. Now, that's why, you know, I wanted you to recognise that Zoe is one of these people. Like, I don't think you should all ask Zoe to help you immediately, but Zoe can help you and Zoe also knows a network of people. So those of us who know this stuff know the networks. So it is really important to ask and, and search it out, search out some help. Um, we had a question Renee from, asking yes. why knowledge to action over other frameworks? Very good question. Simply, it works. It's a very good process map. It's not a theory of itself. It tells you what to do. And it tells you the basic order, but also recognises that sometimes you have to go backwards and forwards. It doesn't tell you how to do it. And that's why you need other implementation and behavioural theories to help you analyse the why. So I find the KTA is really straightforward and, and offers a very simple plan that you can build on. And yeah, thanks, Hajin, for saying that you found it straightforward. And to be honest, I have used it now for 20 years. I've taken it to biomedical engineers in um, in South America and had it translated. I was translated into Spanish as, as I was teaching it and they got it. To me, that shows that it's it makes sense beyond. Um, or well, beyond just healthcare professionals. Yeah, somebody has said. Um, Organisational backing is more likely if the change is likely to save money. Yes, but my concern is do not try and initiate a change to save money as the only reason. Most people will balk at that. Um, look for other reasons for, for making the change. And that is where you look at the behaviours, um, the barriers and facilitators of individuals, individuals' behaviours. Why do they want this change? Why is it important in this organisation now? What are the potential benefits? And look at the research evidence for what the benefits might be, because the research evidence will tell you that this intervention will generally achieve this, this and this. And so look at those and see if they're important in your business. So hey, Jin Lee has her hand up. Hey, Jin, do you want yeah. to ask a question? Hey, Hi Sharon, um, thanks for uh, hi, thanks for the lecture. Uh, my name is Hajin. I'm a transitional nurse practitioner uh, from Byron Hospital. I've got a question um, in terms of uh, using knowledge to action uh, framework um, in introducing a um, new role in um, in our area health. Um, so yeah, my my um, uh, my issue and um, struggle has been um, uh, coming to a new role, uh, which is not uh, people are not that familiar with um, traditional nurse practitioner or nurse practitioner role um, in the um, system. And um, I feel like I, I came as a bit of um, a stranger or <laughs> um, a threat to the system. So um, in this uh, 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 case. How do you think um, knowledge to action uh, framework will uh, can um, support my uh, role transition or um, make use of my role in uh, in the uh, in this system? I, I would like your opinion on this. Okay, no, that thank you for your question. I think that's a really important question because, yes, it's it's not always intuitive when people see the diagram. And one thing I've done, and I've done this with a group of nurses actually, is I've asked them, well. Can you tell me the quality improvement process? 
and ask them to brainstorm the quality improvement process. And then if you can get an idea about components of what they think are important in the quality improvement process, if you can map those onto the outside ring of the knowledge to action framework, because essentially the out, outside gray ring is actually the quality improvement process. And so I would, that's how I've done it in the past is I've started with, you know, a linear map of what people think is quality improvement. I've mapped it against the circle because I recognize that sometimes you have to go backwards and forwards. And then I think what I often talk about, what makes knowledge translation or implementation science different to quality improvement is that we're using a research evidence to guide and, and really monitor that change. Um, so that it's it's more than just um, a local improvement. Does that make sense for you? Uh, yes. Um, thanks for um, thanks for your uh, answer um, to my question. Yeah. Um, but uh, it uh, it just leads me um, there. There are lots of uh, work um, for me to do uh, to make um, improvement and change it to where where I work. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a big um, homework um, as well as my uh, mission for future. Thank you. Yeah. No, that's helpful. Now, someone's asked about specific implementation research grants. This is tricky. <clears throat> there are we are getting implementation research monies through MRFF and maybe less likely through NHMRC. So it is happening at the top level. Um, but there are also um, sometimes if you're in Queensland, there is an opportunity right now to express your interest to attend a knowledge translation subject at Bond University to learn this process. And then there's also um, the TRIP a group, um, Translation Research in Practice group um, in Queensland Health that actually um, will provide grants for allied health pro um, professionals. Um, I know that the ACI has got an implementation arm. I don't know what they're doing at the moment, but I guess Adrian and Zoe, that might be something for, for, um, for future sort of monitoring, but, yeah, grants in this space are really tricky. They're not as um, as prevalent as we would like. Um, but I think we there's also ways, and I guess what I've tried to do is um, use this as part of quality improvement activities within a system. Maybe use it that way to get some internal funding. Yeah, it's a it's a tricky space because we're working in a sort of in a more positivist research world where once you know they want to see experiments and outcomes whereas we're we're actually um needing a bit more time to take through take this process through well, thank you very much sharon i'm just conscious of time so i think i might uh, draw this discussion to a close a very big thank you sharon for taking the time to so elegantly cover and although you said it was just an intro to the knowledge to action framework, I think it's very useful and particularly relevant for us as, as healthcare you know, staff and, and workers. Uh, and also a big thank you to Zoe for you know mm. presenting today and also your continued support and driving, I guess, the R clan agenda and all the work you do in the background to make this a reality. Thank you all for your time today for attending. Uh, hopefully we can see you at next month's session. Uh, so I'll draw this session to a close, thanking everyone for their continued and ongoing support. Uh, enjoy your rest of your day and hopefully we'll see you again in the near future. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much.